Hey, welcome in everybody to the Sports Fanatic News Sportscast as we are here for our next episode covering the NHL trade deadline that just surpassed us and uh, some moves made. Uh, one guy already scored um, that was moved from the NHL trade deadline. Of and then, course. So um, get into um, some NBA talk secondary here as that season ends now match with the NHL's date. I think both are set for May 16th, if I'm not mistaken, okay. um, at this current um, time. So they both are ending around the same time, both coming into the uh, stretch run here. So we'll get into conversations about those two leagues. Our NFL talk will be a little bit more based on the draft and how we like the mock draft picks for our two respective teams of the both Pennsylvania teams, the Steelers and uh and uh, Eagles here, and then also what we think of the top five or top ten overall, depending how much time we have, what we'll get into as an overall structure there. And then we'll uh, wrap up with baseball again, being that's the new season that started. I figure it's always good to wrap up with the sport that's the newest in our minds and the one that everyone is watching again. But first and foremost, Steele, uh, how are you doing today? Uh, I don't think I have to introduce Steele anymore. He's obviously the Don, the leader of our Steel Flyers website. But uh, how are you doing uh this fine season, or Wednesday. Oh, man. I'm telling you what. I'm ready to talk about sports. I'm ready to get into it, man. We had we had a, a great uh, trade deadline show over on Off the Wall Hockey. Uh, we had everybody from the Steel Flyers Network was able to hop onto that show, and we gave you complete coverage from 10 o'clock until what? When did you guys log out? Like 5, I think? Sometime after, I don't think it was that late. I think it was like after four, but it, we were going to hop off, and then that Mantha tree. Came. Right. So so that's why that's the reason why. We're doing it. <laughs> but yeah, man, I uh, really appreciate everybody doing that. Um, thanks, Joe, for being uh, the host of this show, man. Really love talking about sports, and, and anytime I get a chance to sit down and talk about sports with, with the professor, man, I'm down. So let's get into it, my man. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, we're safe. Uh, Mantha's the big kahuna trade, so we might as well talk about that a little bit more as we go in and not start with the best there. Usually that's not how you do that. But um, a trade <laughs> How are you doing? How are you doing, man? Doing well, doing well. It's a good week. Um, uh, the baseball started. I've been mainly paying attention to other hockey teams as the stretch run uh, yep. dies down here um, and just paying attention to who impresses me as young guys when it comes to the Flyers at this point. But exactly. um, it's, it's still been pretty good. Um, but I think as we dive right into some trades here when it comes to the NHL, one of the ones I did like the most, even though I still don't think they'll be able to protect him in the expansion draft. So I feel like the Ducks have a plan of action to make sure Hayden Flurry's not taken by Ron Francis, but uh, get, getting uh, getting Hayden Flurry to the Ducks uh, made sense to me because they just traded a sixth and Hockenpah, who's developed into a solid guy like Pearson, but a bigger defensive defenseman doesn't have the up potential of a Hayden Flurry, who was a top draft, the guy that everyone thought would be potentially a top three. Yeah, but defensive. you know what though, I I really like Hockenpah's game though, and oh, I it's really. A good Veteran yeah, the and, difference is he's a bottom three defenseman. Hayden Flurry's yeah. potential is top three. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed. I mean, that's probably why they also got the sixth round draft pick with that as well, too. But I really do like Hawk and Paw's game, and he's he comes at a cheap price. You know what I mean? He's only like seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. I thought this was somebody that the Flyers would be looking at. You know what I mean? I I just. Yeah, yeah. I just thought this would be somebody that they would be looking at because he would be coming in cheap. He would be somebody that they could bring I in now and help out now. Is kind of, you already have Hag and Morin, and I think Hawk yeah. is similar to the right-handed version of yep, yep. Morin, so you're adding in a lot of similarity, just physical shot blocking, guys, which is not as much of today's age but if you want to do it and it yeah. works great but you would have to you would have to uh, make sure it works because that's not really the style as much um anymore to have all those guys in your lineup if it works you look great if it doesn't then you don't look right great. yeah obviously. yeah obviously. but i'll tell you what though we for for we thought that i mean uh, there was a a few of us that felt that the day was going rather slow uh because there wasn't a lot of moves but a lot of like the big name moves actually happened on like the saturday and sunday you know what i yeah, mean beforehand. and there were still some good ones the day of. oh yeah 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 um i mean it was interesting that the value you ended up getting for hall was not much different than sam bennett um but with the bennett trade to the panthers they got 
technically two seconds where Bjork was actually um, when my friend Zach looked it up a fifth. So they didn't even get two seconds for Hole because Bjork was actually a later round pick. And then they got the second with the Hole trade uh, where with the Flames, they got Emil Heineman, who's a good a guy that they were talking about could come over next year, even just because of his wits and smarts from overseas. And just one of those good um, players that plays the game the right way and is a great straight line skater. Um, yeah. So he makes some good sense for the Flames, plus another second they got for 2022. So that trade makes the most sense for both teams because Sam Bennett is, he was good in the playoffs, but I think had to get out of Calgary, have no pressure of being the draft pick he was. Yeah. And he's going to Florida, just like Pirlo and I simply put this trade yesterday. The best way to sum this trade up is he's going to Florida just to be him. He doesn't have to worry about being that draft pick that they expect. More. Right. He's going to Florida just to do the game. They relieve expect. the pressure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Getting from yeah. Him. Relieve cool. the pressure, you know. And 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 the Flames actually did another deal, too, where they where they dealt goalie uh, Riddich, David Riddich, Riddich to the true. Toronto. Uh, for uh, out as well in the first game as Toronto hoped. Um, but. <laughs> well. <laughs> But, I mean, that was – I mean, we all thought that Calgary were going to be more sellers this this past um, coming trade deadline owing to the, the coaching uh, change and all the changes that are going on in Calgary. And we expected a little bit more from Calgary, I think, uh, than what we did get. I mean, we did get two moves, but I thought we were expecting maybe a little bit more uh, coming out of Calgary. Yeah, I mean – I feel like Calgary is also a team that has to do a lot in the offseason because most of the guys are going to move, unless if you're moving your bottom depth guys, like your Riddich as a goaltender comparison. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're not going to move like Lindholm in season, probably. You're not going to move, well, you're definitely not going to move Goudreau in season. So, like, they have a lot of trades that would be more probably off season than it would be. You're not going to move Hannafin unless you find the right team, most likely in season either. So right. if, if you move guys coming off of good years to try to get the best and you move guys that are aging, I feel like Calgary's team was kind of a team that was more set up to have to make moves more off season than in season. But uh, that's just the way that I kind of perceived. Um, yeah, them that there. makes sense. They're definitely I mean, that one makes of sense. hockey's more disappointing teams this year, though, the Calgary Flames. They yeah. They should be a, better than they – they're another team. <laughs> it's like the Flyers should be much better than they are well, with their with their roster, but they're not. So. Right, exactly. And you know what else? Uh, I really thought that, that Toronto had won the, the day, but I really maybe think Florida maybe might have won the day here, I think, um, with the moves that Florida has made. Yeah, I mean, Toronto's going to be interesting because it's kind of like Pirlo and I were talking about um, before we started his show yesterday in the chat. It seems like some of the deadline might have been a little bit less active just because people are looking at how much um, teams like um, Washington getting Mantha are going for, obviously, a repeat. You have Tampa looking like they're going uh, forward again here. So it seems like everybody's kind of uh, pushing to go for it of those two teams plus Colorado. So some teams yeah. that are kind of in the middle ground went, well, unless if we really get going at the right time, we're probably not going to beat yeah. them in a playoff series. So there's no point at just going all in and wasting asset picks to get people that are not going to get us fully. Toronto seems to think, obviously, they're the other team. Yeah. That has a chance for that deeper run because otherwise I don't think you give up a first right. and a fourth for Nick Felino, who's a more defensive forward at this point. But that's exactly what they need. But that's a move that shows you they think they can compete exactly into the postseason. Now, exactly that's more of a waiting game because a lot of people think the North Division, when you read stuff, is a lot more running gun than any other division. So how are they going to play anybody in the North, let alone just Toronto? Once right. they get postseason and play outside of their division, exactly. So that's going to be what's interesting to see. Because once they get up against teams like in the East and in the Central, 
you know what I mean, depending on who the North is going to be playing for their next round of playoffs once they get out of their division, you know what I mean? They're going to be facing teams that are going to be um, a lot less run and gun, and they're going to need that more defensive-minded type players. That's why I think Toronto did a really good job with bringing uh, Felino in there. And, and you know, what? see, here's the... Here's what I think the paradigm issue was with this trade deadline. The teams that were expected to be big sellers are not or did not become big it's also sellers. Because they came back into the playoff race. That, that's what I mean. Yeah. Because those teams that we expected to be big sellers are in a playoff race right now. So they want to try to keep everybody as, as best as they can to try to make their run to get into the playoffs. So teams that were going to be sellers this particular tra- trade deadline were not. And teams that were buyers this particular trade deadline particularly were not as well. It was kind of the exact opposite where you would, you would think teams like at the top, Toronto, C- Colorado, uh, you know, Florida wouldn't be making as many moves, but they were the ones that made some of the most moves, Boston and, you know, others that made some of those moves, the Islanders, you know, bringing in um, their, those guys and stuff like Cal that. Mary and Zajac, yeah. that. That's what I mean. So they're making all these moves. These top teams are making the moves and the bottom teams aren't. You know, that's the other thing, too, where the teams that don't have any money – are the teams that, you know, are in it. And teams that don't have, are teams that have a whole bunch of money, are teams that are not in it. Yeah, yeah. There's only teams that they made a trade it was going to be more for planning ahead if the Kings acquired someone they could have for now that has a contract that's younger, but they could also have for the future. That's the only way you thought a deal for someone like a Goudreau or a Eichel, but he's injured, uh, could have got done uh, in season um, if it went through. L.A. or somebody that has a, the cap space. That would have been the that's only cool. one. That would have been the yeah. only one. You know what I mean? I don't or think those deals are going to happen during the trade deadline. I guess wanted to give up some of his Detroit prospects, but I wouldn't foresee that. So no. I would say more going through L.A. Yeah. Um, but I still feel like that's the main team to look at for a lot of these guys in the offseason, too, just because of the money they have and the assets to trade for them. But that's something that's uh, later down the line. But <laughs> when it comes to the Canadians, I thought the Canadians are one of the more interesting teams on deadline day because they're trying to play, as we uh, know, um, since they brought in uh, Dominique, uh, uh, Dominique uh, Ducharme there, um, who I usually just call by his last name because I th- – I usually botch his first name, but um, he. Because really, I would think it would be easier to say Dominique than it would be. They're they're trying to bring in um, a more defensive thing, which is what John Merrill is. It certainly is not what Eric Gustafson is. Um, right. So I find it interesting what they were doing because it seemed like when they got him in, it was to change their system and be the the Canadian team that kind of more ran a defensive with an offensive system and wasn't as much like Toronto's defense has been better by the numbers this year. But if you look at their team, there's still a lot of running gunning, even with that better before defense. They're not the most defensively sound where it looked like the Canadians, the way they said, okay, we don't have the most skill of our division. Obviously. So the way we had to compete is to try to be the most defensively sound. The rumors they had in the deadline and the fact that they brought in Gus plus John Murrow and were also interested in Tony. Uh, makes me think I don't know exactly what they're doing with their defense. Yeah. Uh, but because <laughs> you have Gus, who's more offensive. You have Tony D'Angelo, who's also more offensive and issues. Um, and then you have Merle, who's more defensive. So it's it seems like they're trying to figure out how they want to mix their offense and defense on their defense. And that's something they're kind of stuck with right exactly now. they yeah. were a little bit interesting of a team to follow just because of the rumors where the Murrow acquisition makes sense because he's a defensive defenseman i'm happy they took gus from the flyers because they we don't need eric gustafson but they, but it just didn't make much sense to have interest in him and then pick him up after you already have enough defense depth and got john Murrow before that so it, it was just kind of weird uh they their deadline yeah what they what they were able to pick up you know what i mean so um I, I'm, I'm looking up and down the list here of things and i'll tell you what i think boston and the islanders also would have to i would have to say get get an a plus for the trade deadline weekend 
<laughs> if you want to go back that far because of what they were able to achieve uh, and what they were able to attain um, over the weekend before the trade deadline was 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 happening. I mean, I think those were probably the biggest names that went out there aside from Tyler or Taylor Hall uh, that went to Boston, you know what I mean? And then obviously the the uh, uh, the Mantha that we'll talk about later, right? Uh, but I, I really, really like what Boston did uh, with getting Lazar, getting Riley, and then getting Hall for practically nothing. You know what I mean? Even if yeah. he is a rental player, you know, I understand that. But if he does end up signing there, then that could be a boon for Boston. Yeah, and the big thing for Taylor Hall is he's one of those guys they brought him up um, – on the deadline day that once he gets into the postseason, no matter how he's doing with that regular season, he's one of those guys that his numbers, uh, the other guys they used were Coyle, uh, Marcus Johansson, Jaden Schwartz, and Pavelski to highlight that example, that his numbers go up points per game wide always in the postseason. And that's what the, the Bruins know they'll be able to score enough. Um, and unless a miracle happens, the Rangers and the Flyers short as hecking catch them. The Rangers probably aren't. Uh, so, um, they know that they just have to get there, and they're getting a guy that they think will help them to maybe propel farther than people anticipated uh, into the playoffs if he gets his game uh, fully going. And that's also a similar reason why Florida brought in Sam Bennett, because they know even though they're doing really well this year, they're still a kind of a year ahead of them. Yeah. And yeah. eventually they might catch Tampa, or they're ha- if they do get through the East, they have to probably beat Colorado or Vegas. So. They know right. they have to bring in guys that are going to perform at the top of their game playoff style wise. And then regular season is just what they do in the uh, regular season um, at that point. Exactly. But, I mean, uh, all day long, though, for, for what the Boston was able to do on trade deadline day or the day a couple of days before, I thought that was really good moves for them. I also really, really they also like brought in Mike Riley. Who was yeah, that's what. Yeah. Senators. Um, uh, kind of like a journeyman, um, six, uh, six, seven defenseman, but now produced as a guy that seemed like he could steadily stay in your lineup as the bottom pair defenseman. So if he can do that, that would help the Bruins since they've obviously had issues with their defense depth uh, whenever he's able to get match in the lineup since he's coming down from Canada. But that that seemed like a, a pretty good aid there to go with Taylor Hall. So it seems like they made good moves. Um, to plan for the playoffs, but also not um, screw themselves over for the uh, future either. So. Exactly, exactly. And so that's why I thought they did really well with, with for what they were able to pick up and what they were able to do. They were able to address that defensive need, and they were able to bring in some scoring depth, you know what I mean? So that's definitely what the Boston needed. So they were able to do well. I also like what the Islanders did too. Um, the fact that they were able to bring in uh, Paul Mary and, and Zay Jack for that matter, you know what I mean? Getting, getting the, because of Anders Lee being out, you know what I mean? That, that I think it, it didn't necessarily affect them per se, as far as their points production, but it definitely affected the room because that's their captain. You know what I mean? And being being able to bring in guys that can come in and they can plug in right away that are going to be instant uh, help for your team. Uh, that's and instant I think. leaders for your team. Also. Exactly, 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 exactly. So um, that's why I really like what the Islanders did. Yeah, yeah, I like the the Islanders. Um, the nice thing, too, about that, Tom Fitzgerald, Ryan Fitzgerald's father, um, Phantoms player, um, decided to um, be very nice about it, too, and even said, like Pirlo said on his show, I hope we have the last pick in the draft as a division. Classy. I mean, that's just so classy. Of the Islanders, he said, I hope we have the last pick um, in the draft because he wants to see his guys in Palmieri and Zajac win. And that that trade also made perfect sense because Lou Amarello used to be with the Devils. Yep. And then came to the Islanders, so he already knows Palmieri and JJ. Exactly, exactly. And with Anders Lee being the captain going down and then needing that kind of leadership in the room there, that was a really good idea with bringing uh, that particular guy into the room there. And that's somebody that Lou Lou Lamorello had known about, has history with, you know what I mean? And that's why I think think we saw the move with Jeff Carter to Pittsburgh. Because of Ron Hextall. Oh, yes, Brian Brian Burke and Ron Hextall. Yeah. 
like Jeff Jeff Carter and uh, talked tremendously about him. Then Hextall has the direct connection, of course, with uh, Jeff Carter and uh, being in L.A. when he went to L.A. So exactly, and that's why I thought that we got to see that Jeff Carter because he he was originally had a no no movement clause or no trade clause. And he was, I guess, convinced at the 12th hour to go to Pittsburgh. And it's like, well, gee, you get to play it with Sidney like Crosby. Fam- yeah, All right. it, seemed like, it seemed like family because when I saw his uh, wife tweet something out of thanks for the support with California, it seemed like since he has people in PA still yeah. that he wanted to eventually just come back to Pennsylvania. And, and, and he still has his place in Sea Isle. Like you're oh, seeing does. down the shore sometime if you go. Oh, down. okay. But okay. um, I didn't know he still was coming back to the area. Yeah, he's still in the area at times. So I feel like it might have been a family uh, thing. Like, let me just go back to PA before I actually retire, and then I'll probably retire shortly. Um, so right. I feel like it might have been um, one of those things. But I think that was a good um, move for Jeff Carter um, career-wise, because like the Kings said when they traded him, uh, we he he doesn't owe us anything anymore, really. Uh, we'll just uh, we're, we're trying to thank him by giving him a chance to uh, win somewhere else um, as he rides on into the sunset. So that's also a nice way for an organization uh, to look at it for a player that helped them uh, win a cup um, when they came in there. So yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> I mean, you know. So all right, I guess we got to talk about it now, huh? But, well, first, before we go into the big trades, I did want to highlight a couple small ones that I think are going to work out. Well, Pirlo highlighted one, but it also worked out already in the game um, Monday evening that uh, Volkov in the game Stolarz went off, scored two of the Ducks' goals uh, in the shutout that Stolarz broke the Ducks' record with 46 saves. Uh, He came over for just a seventh in Moran, I'm kind of with Pirlo on that. He looked like a guy buried in Tampa that might get going with the Ducks. The Ducks take a lot of chances on guys that they hope get going in their organization, but it's smart because if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It didn't work with Milano. Like Pirlo said, Dayton Heineen, the jury's kind of still out on. But we yeah. Say, uh, Volkov and Flurry, though, those seem like two pretty good uh, trial by fire. Let's see what they can do. Um, pickups um, for them there. And then another good small pickup with the Canadians that actually made sense a while ago was Eric Stahl, that people coming at that move didn't make any sense because just because you played for Buffalo doesn't mean you forget how to compete in a playoff run. It just means basically the meme that they had with Anthony Mantha, which was when they were up 4-1, to one, it was the coach for the Capitals talking to them, and they were like, so this is a multi-goal lead. So um, you do blah, 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 because he was on the Red Wings beforehand and probably very rarely ever had a multi-goal lead. So, yeah, um, right. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, you don't just forget how to compete. So I think Stahl was a good pickup. Brandon Lemuse looked good since going to L.A. Uh, looked like he was going to be an odd man out, probably an expansion draft pickup from the Rangers anyway. So that seemed like a uh, yeah. smart move there. And then when it came to the Blackhawks, there were another team that I think did really good on the deadline day. Before that, they brought back Vinny Hina-Stroza coming up to de- – or not even on deadline day, coming up to deadline day. They brought in uh, Brett Conley. They traded Lucas Carlson. It wasn't working as well for them. The guy that I listened to from the Chicago Tribune that explained that uh, Stillman's uh, probably the better of the two. So they swapped young defense, and they got Walmart out to Florida, who's more of a um, guy you put in your lineup. And out of your lineup, that's a – young guy that can compete at uh that has a high compete level that's probably more for a playoff run team than a chicago team and the big thing that this guy was saying uh when it came to the blackhawks that covers them is bjorkstrom's the big kahuna they like in here come bringing him over from overseas who fell out of he kind of fell out of florida kind of fell out of favor more with him than i think the other way but um but uh he's able to move on and then he's able to go somewhere where it seems like like they said, they want him to come over next year, start implementing himself into the system, and you'll see what he's able to do, but he still has good potential. Plus, you brought in a veteran in Brett Conley, who if you can get him going again, you definitely have the guys that can set him up in Kirby Doc. Uh, whenever Taze comes back, if he does, uh, hopefully you have Jonathan Taze, and then you have Pia Suter, who's proven himself as a good guy from overseas as an undrafty. So uh, I think that team was another team that was pretty smart. Um, on top of the Avalanche, just because you brought in Dubnik as a goalie, you brought back Carl Soderberg, who has familiarity. Yep. 
Yep. And you brought back Patrick Nemeth, who has familiarity. And the only thing people said they would envision Colorado doing is maybe getting center depth, maybe getting defense depth and a goaltender. And they did all three of those things. Exactly. So um, it seems like <laughs> it seems like they definitely know what they're doing. And then Montour to Florida, I think, is going to be wonderful for Braden Montour. Yeah, I just yeah. Get him, get out, get him out, out of Buffalo. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to see him get the hell out of Buffalo. Yeah. Because I, uh, he's a guy that seems like he has more in the skates and get uh, your bags out of Buffalo. Yeah, get your bags out of Buffalo. <laughs> so board to Tampa, obviously, that trade seemed that was great. Yeah, good. That move. trade seemed to Tampa didn't even seem like they thought that trade would happen, and then they're like, "Oh, really? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, right." Do. You know, right. that's oh. the other thing too. That was the other thing too. That was part of that whole group of teams that we didn't expect to be sellers, like Columbus. Like, who would have thought that they would have been the, the sellers that they were this year? Because obviously the wheels fell off for them. You know what I mean? And they're not even they're not even going to be, you know, considered for being in the playoffs. So we weren't necessarily expecting the Columbus to be sellers, right? No, no. I think the uh, Breeze Boz just kind of had that fall in. They're only paying 25 percent for Savard, too, which is um nice um to have right. that go through. And speaking of having money funnel through your team. Doug Wilson with the Sharks did a good job of doing that to bring in some extra draft capital, just kind of being everybody's banker um, at this trade deadline to uh, help uh, take in some salaries. So he did a good job bringing in some draft capital to do that. And another underrated move is the Blackhawks getting Adam Goldet, um, who won the Hobie Baker while he was still in college. Not recently, obviously, that was Cole Caulfield. Uh, but yeah. his last year in college, he won the Hobie Baker um, and then he's a guy I think will be able to break out potentially there and do some good things as well. They need more forward and or center depth, depending where they decide to put him. He's played, he looked a little bit better on wing in the NHL, but, uh, we'll have to see as time yeah, goes sure. on. And then yeah. Jan Mark, they were then able because of gold debt to get a second and third for him, which I don't think they envisioned trading him until they honestly got Adam gold debt fall into their lap. So uh, that ended up working out for Chicago also. So I think they did a good job at the deadline, too. But, yeah. But, yeah, I guess uh, you're right. At this point, we could get into the one loan, um, the big hockey, the quote-unquote hockey trade, which is like the team's actually preparing for making a trade for someone that has years that they're trying to get as a big uh, future core player of their organization, which is what the capital – I'm um, thinking as a good mix-in player, basically the hockey equivalent to Jason Worth, um, is going to mix in well yeah. and help you a lot, um, just like a guy they signed um, years ago for their baseball team. Um, but he's a guy that did. He scored right away in his first game. Um, you got rid of Panic, who really was starting to just kind of be not needed there anymore. He was not always in the lineup. Right, he wasn't right. I mean, the only one I think that really is going to is the, the Verona one. But and I, I don't think, know how much that hurts DC either because it didn't look like Lavi was that big of a fan of Jacob Vrana because he was getting healthy scratched and was even though he was doing all right it seemed like from the onset if you would look at him and number wise he was doing all right it looked like he wasn't Lavi's most favorite guy where we know Lavi likes those big boys that can crash the net have a good shot um, and that's exactly what Mantha is so I feel like he fits into more what. Peter Laviolette once, and that's also exactly. why Cavill's one with this, where Vrana fits in more with what Detroit needs because you need somebody to keep up with Dylan Larkin as he rushes a zone so you can actually yes. have that line do its best. Vrana's someone that can keep up with Dylan Larkin. So that that, that exactly. might that can probably help both teams. Panic will probably just play on their third line or something. And then right. they also got a first and a second. So uh, they're getting more and more draft capital. And that's Iserman drafting. So he's usually been pretty good no matter where that first round pick is, even if it's basically a second with the last pick of the first. Yeah, yeah, that they get back from the Capitals. You know, the Capitals also uh, picked up uh, Michael Roffel, too, from the Flyers. For a fifth round draft pick, and I think that's also going to help them with some of their forward depth as well, too. Uh, with, yeah. with what the Capitals need, I mean, he didn't play last night, uh, in the game, uh, but he could be that forward depth for them where he can pretty much play up and down the lineup. I mean, we know what Raffle's skill set is and what they what he brings to the table, so 
Yeah, he's a guy that can definitely play up and down. I do think Mantha going to because he isn't. Um, he's a guy that will be able to facilitate to you and also score. But he's also a guy that you need to have people on his lines that like you found out, which is fine. Not everybody like Mike Hoffman's obviously not a line runner. Um, but not everybody in the league's a line runner. Some guys need to be guys that do just really well on their line with the guys around them. But man, right. a guy that will do really well when put in the right situations. I mean, he had already 24 goals in 17, 18, 25 and 18, 19. And this guy, if he really gets going, still has that potential. He's only 26 to have the 35 to 40 if you set him up and get him in the right spots. And that's what... Washington has. You have the Nicholas Backstroms of the world. He's one of the best passers of maybe all time and definitely our current um, age. I've got to be up there. uh, You have him, and then you have Ovechkin who takes any attention away from you if you're ever on the ice with him while on the power play. So that just benefits you, even though he doesn't pass to you often, but that just benefits you from that. And then you have Kuzi, that's a good assist guy as well. So they, they got a lot lot of guys that are going to be able to really set up Mantha. And then Mantha, like he did yesterday, if you give him enough room, he has long strides. He's able to create his own shot a bit. He's just a guy that's more you would rather see get in front of the net, uh, clog up the goalie with his big 6-5. I was just going to say, because he's a big uh, frame. frame. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. and he's good at deflecting the puck. That's what you would normally like to see. I think in Washington, you see his numbers in possession in the course you, and the Fenwick go right back over the 50 percentiles you want, and he'll be doing what he's supposed to do. I think that's one of those trades. It's a high risk for Washington, obviously. Detroit's bringing in the um, Vrana and a first and a second. So even if Vrana didn't work out as well, if you draft somebody that does, that balances yeah. it. So the... I think it's a bigger risk for D.C., but it's also D.C. showing their fans we're going for a repeat and we're getting a guy that we think fits in perfectly to our lineup that everyone knows has more skill than he showed in Detroit most right. recently, um, just due to probably outside stuff of not being as – knowing he doesn't fit in as much with the team anymore, being in, <laughs> being in trade rumors in D.C. Yeah. That eventually catches up to you usually. And that usually that pressure kind of gets to you, you know what I mean, and and stuff like that, you know, um, that it does make it kind of tough. So, I, I I don't know. I thought the 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 uh, trade deadline went really well um, as far as that's concerned. I mean, um, this being a really odd year and a whole bunch of different things going on with with only about sixteen or seventeen games left now for the rest of the season for most of the teams. Uh, you know what I mean? It's and and the top teams now are starting to separate themselves, and you're starting to see those top three, four teams from each division is now starting to kind of pull away from the lower uh, from the lower teams that aren't making it. You know what I mean? So I think as the games go on, you're going to start to see more and more of that, more and more of the separation, more and more of the pulling away. You know what I mean? Um, where you're going to start seeing some of those top three four teams are gonna and and even some of those teams are battling it out too Mm -hmm. you you know what i mean like i don't think the central is set i think that's going to go down to the wire quite honestly uh no yeah you got tampa florida and carolina all tied right now nashville's not going to catch them so whoever's in fourth will be in fourth but um unless if a miracle happens there but you have the other three teams that are Oh, right there, even with each other. That I agree with you. That one, um, by s- strength of roster, I feel like I would just slightly favor Tampa since they're all tied right now. But from way of play for going into a playoff run, you would probably want to play the game of the Hurricane. So it's kind, of, it's kind of a little, <laughs> it's a little. Well- Hard to judge. Yeah, but you get Kucherov back though from Tampa Bay at, at the when, at the end of the season. You know what I mean? And, and oh, that will help for the playoff run. I'm just talking about winning the Central. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I got yeah. you. I got you. Yeah, right. where I, I I like the Carolina plays that perfect going into the playoffs, good on both ways style. Tampa does that well, but still at times has a has their defense be the reason right. they lose a game. And then uh, Florida has been good. On both ends, Nashville's the team that uh, is good for them to come back into the standings, but they're not in that Elko. Um, But 
I would say out of those teams, if we're going for the cup, the best Stanley Cup contender would be Tampa. So I'll just go based off of that for who I think's the best team coming out in the Central, whether they win the division or not. I would say, especially with Kucherov coming back, the best Cup contender of that. Yeah, team. yeah, yeah. Uh, I, 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 we both, we all like Florida. We all like Colorado, or, uh, Carolina. But look, you got to face the facts, and and the facts are, I think that Tampa Bay is pretty much going to be the team to beat out there in this in in the central so i mean you know that's kind of just where that's at but when you look at teams like in the west where that's a little bit closer and those even though the top the top four teams are starting to pull away but those all those top four teams are still kind of fighting it out with colorado with with um uh vegas uh you know what i mean and and then minnesota i think is going to be the the fourth Probably the third. Minnesota will be or the third, third. right? The, the, they're more of a top three fight, too, but Minnesota would have to catch up because uh, they're at 51 to 58 for Vegas, 62 points for Colorado. Uh, wow. St. Louis is at 44 to um, Arizona's 43, and then San Jose is not too far behind at 40. Um, right, so, so those top two are selected, but the ones underneath are still kind of fighting it out. Yeah, I mean, the Wild would really have to struggle to all of a sudden not not be in third place, I would think, at 51 yeah. four points, especially with St. Louis never finding their – being able to get fully consistent with the Wild have actually had runs this year. The Blues have always gone on runs and then going on back. Other and ends. Five <laughs> <points to> play <laughs> yeah. <for the> so <laughs> uh, I feel like that division, though, I think when it comes to your favorite, it's still – probably Colorado because most people I mean they're a plus 52 I had Vegas coming in in the Stanley Cup I think now I would flip that to favor in Colorado and have Vegas be my second team in the West because Vegas still looks really good but and they have, they're at a plus 38 normally when you look at a plus 38 goal differential you're like holy crap that's amazing and yeah. then you look at Colorado's and go oh they're a plus 52 uh, so, uh, um, so our, our plus 36 doesn't look like much does it so I would say Colorado <laughs> Uh, for and beyond, uh, as we uh, wrap up our uh, NHL talk uh, on this uh, edition of the Sports United Sports Sportscast, is the favor for the Cup right now. Yeah. With uh, Vegas, another West team, being second. Um, and then I would have to put the two East teams, honestly, as Washington and Tampa before I put Toronto. Sorry, Toronto fans, but I, that that's just until I see the playoff run from who was the, well no you said you said one east team washington who was the other east team huh you said one east team washington against tampa but who would be the other east team no you i think washington and tampa are favorites over well normally toronto would be an eastern conference uh, yeah right and, and so that's why that's why i was a little confused there because i honestly i think the islanders are more so coming out of the East than anything. I mean, I when I look at what they how they've been playing, I know they're back and forth with with uh, Washington, and there's going to be a couple games here that's going to come up with, between the Islanders and Washington, and I'm going to be looking forward to those. But because obviously um, Washington's on top right now with 60 points, and the Islanders at 58. But I like with what. Um, both teams did at the trade deadline, and I think it's going to be a race between those two teams, Washington and the Islanders. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the I Isles, I just um, – Washington, like Tampa's already obviously won it. You have a lot of guys from that. Washington's won you have a lot of guys from that. Islanders, I think they have the team to do it. You just need to see um, – I don't think they have the equivalency of – well, to Washington, they might because they have a young guy um, with a veteran. Washington has two young guys. But um, when it comes to some of the other teams with how, like, Ruby stepped up for Colorado to put them in the comparison for Stanley Cup um, contenders, um, how somebody like even, I don't know, Drigger has done in Florida, I feel like the Islanders, Sorokin's doing really well, but how's a rookie going to – you have to wait to see how a rookie and then Varlamov – um, does in the playoffs. He did pretty good last year. Will he do well again? Yeah. That, that's that's my only 
thing um, with the Isles. They play the great playoff style game, so I feel like they are a contender. They would be in my top four, um, yeah, for sure. But it, it's a it's a toss up. I would say it, it is. It's tough. I would say the top two contenders in the league are definitely Vegas and Colorado. Though. Those would be my t- if I'm going league wide, I would go uh, Colorado, Vegas. Um, See, I, I would, I would, I would Colorado, not. Washington, Tampa, and then the Islanders, and then... See, I would go with Colorado, then I would go with Toronto, then I would go with Washington, right? And then I would put um, Carolina and then Vegas. Because... First, so who was your first place team? Right. Oh, Colorado. Colorado, okay, got Colorado, it. Colorado, yeah. and then I would go with Toronto next... Then I would put Washington third, right, and Carolina fourth, and Vegas fifth. The reason why is because, for one, Vegas is at 41 games, Islanders are at 42, Washington's at 43, Toronto's at 43, so Vegas has two games in hand on some of the lower ends, but they only have 58 points, where some of the other teams have 60. But there's also five teams that have 58 points. Yeah. Okay. And three of those teams are Carolina, Tampa Bay, and Florida. <laughs> so, you know, it's like it's a it's a five-way tie for fifth place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for me, I just think Vegas and Colorado supplant themselves just because of how much they outscore their opponents. The only other team that's close to that, if you ranked in that order, um, you would put Tampa and Carolina before you put anybody else after uh, Colorado and Vegas. But I, I don't always rank it off of that. I'm just saying I think when it comes to having as stacked of a team as those two have, plus outscoring their opponent, um, that's what, for me, has to put those two as I mean, I, I, I'm with you. I see where you're coming from. I see, you know, yeah. Like, I honestly think that's the teams that um, whoever potentially ends up beating – um, each other will be who is in the Stanley Cup uh, for, the, for the West. So it'll be interesting to see. But that's just, I think, how we put it up there for our Stanley Cup contenders. And we also uh, wrapped up the uh, NHL trade deadline for you. I hope you all enjoy the uh, hockey coverage. Um, yeah, from man. Our- did we have the ad we had to run now? Are we going to go right into this? Yeah, we're going to we're gonna take a quick word from our sponsors. Uh, we'd like to thank cccresorts.com uh, for sponsoring the Steel Flyers All Sports Network. Uh, we'd like to thank them for all the things that uh, they've been able to do as far as helping us and supporting us. And we really appreciate all that. And uh, here's a word from our sponsor. And we'll be right back after this. <laughs> 